And I think on this day of all days, it would be appropriate to start with some dad jokes because I do love dad jokes. You might have noticed I've been kind of filtering them in the last few weeks. Um, I had a revelation. I thought our clothes dryer was shrinking my clothes. Turns out it was the refrigerator all along. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I asked our dog, Tiger, what's two minus two? He said nothing. <laughs> Super smart dog. Super smart dog. And I have to confess, I only know 25 letters of the alphabet. I don't know why. <laughs> ah! <laughs> yeah. Woo! That's awesome. Um, it's Father's Day, and we're just taking a little break between mini-series as we've been in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous teachings, since January. Uh, and we've taken some little breaks along the way, and we just concluded one on Kingdom Finances. Next week, I'm super excited because we're going to start a brand new mini-series on Jesus' teachings, and we're calling the, the series Prayer Matters, or Prayer Matters, or Prayer Matters. Oh, you see what I did there? Yes, it's going to be good. I'm really excited about next week's message. It's going to be good. Make sure you are here. So today, in honor of Father's Day, we're going to look at some principles for raising up the next godly generation. That's the title of the message today, raising up the next godly generation. So would you turn in your Bibles, if you've got a Bible or a smartphone or a tablet with the Bible on it, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. That's what that the code, 1 colon 2, chapter 1, verse 2, NLT stands for New Living Translation. It's a, a modern English translation of the Bible. So just to kind of set it up here a little bit for you, the Apostle Paul was an early church leader, and he was ministering at the time we're going to talk about today, about 20 years after Jesus died and rose again. So again, it gives you a framework of where in history we're talking about. Paul was called to be a missionary that means he traveled away from his homeland, and he preached the word of God, preached the gospel. He planted churches and kind of established leadership and churches so that people would be able to continue to worship God and do the mission of God. Uh, and while he's out there on his travels, he met a young follower of Jesus. And we're, it's not, we're not sure for positive if Paul is the one who led him to the Lord re uh, previously or not. But on Paul's second trip, he met this young follower of Jesus named Timothy. And Timothy had a great reputation in the church. Uh, he was actually known in his home city and the, and the city next door, Lystra and Derby were the two cities. He was known there for his faith. It's, it's, it's pretty cool, especially a young guy. Uh, it's, he was possibly still in his teens, maybe older teens at this point. And the, the Apostle Paul, as he's, as he's going around visiting churches, strengthening churches, he, he hears of him, he, he meets him, and he's very impressed by him. So this elder Paul invites young Timothy to come and join his missionary team. He has quite a team of people that are traveling from city to city. And Timothy... Can you imagine, got to learn ministry firsthand from the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote most of the New Testament through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And they, they uh, got to travel from town to town. And think about it, no planes, trains, or automobiles. So they were mostly hoofing it on foot, sometimes hoofing it on a donkey, Sometimes roughing it in a rustic boat out on the Mediterranean Sea, you know, a boat that they're just trying to keep it from leaking and going down or tipping over in a storm. So they're out there going through all these crazy adventures, all these strange circumstances, and they just get closer and closer. Paul and Silas and, and Timothy and the team, they're, they're bonding because, you know, it's, you're going through hard stuff together. And Timothy got to just observe how Paul dealt with some very challenging people situations. And if you read the New Testament, the, the, the parts that Paul wrote down, you realize, wow, <laughs> he dealt with a lot. In fact, a lot of times, Paul's preaching of Jesus created a citywide riot. So can you imagine him preaching in Seattle and the whole place riots? because of his preaching. Like, that's the kind of thing that was happening. And Timothy got to be there and see how Paul handled it all. And Paul got to the place where he just felt like Timothy was his spiritual son. 
He, he wasn't his, you know, son by blood, uh, but, but he, was, he, he was a spiritual son. In 1 Timothy 1-2, Paul called him his true son in the faith. What a great compliment. Paul, Paul this elder statesman, you are my true son in the faith. So Timothy became kind of an extension or a representative of Paul's ministry, his, his apostleship. And uh, a lot of times we, we think, well, Timothy just was the pastor of one church, but actually he, Paul sent him to at least three different churches that he had started and said, hey, you go, keep, make sure that work's going on, keep strengthening those people, make sure they're, they're obeying God's will, make sure they know real what the Bible really says and what God's word really says, who Jesus really is. And when they were apart, when Paul was going one direction to minister, Timothy was going another direction, Paul would write him letters. Now, if you're under 30, you may not know this, but we used to write like with pens and things on letters, and they, they, they could be kind of lengthy. And Paul wrote some amazing letters instructing Timothy, and those letters became part of the Bible because the Holy Spirit breathed those through him, and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to write this to Timothy, and by the way, we're going to stick that in the teachings for the whole church to know. And so we are still benefiting a couple thousand years later today from their relationship and those letters and those writings. And don't feel bad about reading their mail. It's okay. Yes, it was before the U.S. Postal Service, so no rules. Um, so today I just want to talk about how to be a great spiritual parent, how to be a spiritual mentor to raise up the next godly generation. So whether you are raising kids or like some of my friends, you're raising grandkids at home. Uh, or if you don't have any kids in your home right now, but God has, has placed in your life a younger person, a person younger than you to mentor. Maybe you're 18 and God's given you a 14-year-old to mentor in the ways of the Lord and lead him to Jesus. We're going to talk about today some great principles of godly influence. And uh, Paul uh, maybe didn't set out to tell us this, but... Uh, as we see how he mentored Timothy, I go, oh, wow, there's some great principles for raising kids, raising grandkids, or mentoring the next generation. So several principles, if you're taking notes, the first one is this, set them up for success. That's the first principle. Set them up for success. It's something that we talk about even in our church. Uh, fairly frequently, I've heard Pastor Shelley say this so much, we want to set people up for success, make it easy to sign up, serve, attend, all that stuff, set people up for success. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, um, Timothy said, uh, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. So a prophetic word is when the Holy Spirit comes upon a person and says and gives a message for someone else, for a church or for a person. And Paul is saying, hey, Timothy, remember, you had some prophetic words spoken over you, things like this. I feel like the Spirit of God is saying to you, Timothy, he's called you for a specific purpose in the kingdom of God, and he's going to be with you. You're going to face some challenges, but God is going to be there, and you are gifted in such and such and such. That's, that's a, a prophetic word. And Paul is saying, remember, you had those prophetic words, and so I'm going to give you some instructions based on that. He said, may, they, may my instructions help you fight well in the Lord's battles. So Paul is reminding him of these past prophetic words. He's, he's also looking ahead and saying, oh, some battles are probably coming. Verse 19, he says, cling to your faith. Cling to your faith. Cling is maybe a word that we don't use that much except for cling wrap. And you know what cling wrap does? It, it, it holds on, like, especially when it hits each other. The cling wrap hits the cling wrap. It clings and does not let go, right? And Paul's saying, cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. Why would he say that? Why is this a big deal to Paul? He says, for some people have deliberately violated their consciences as a result their faith has been shipwrecked. Now, this is a very cool passage. When you think of it, you picture this, an older uh, statesman of the church 
a leader, an apostolic leader, mentoring this young guy, raising up the next godly generation. This is, these are the things that he, were important to him to say. He reminds him about the prophetic words, and he gives him words of an encouragement and instruction. Paul was very concerned, and a lot of times when a young person is called by God for a special purpose, special task, special ministry, or when a young person is very gifted at a certain thing, a lot of times, now I can say this from the older end of the spectrum, a lot of times that younger person gets a little overly optimistic. Uh, oh, oh we, can, we can do this, you know, launch this whole ministry with $15. We can do it. Ah, let's take this hill. And, you know, it, it's possible just get a little overly optimistic. And then when times get tough, the younger person gets discouraged. So Paul was trying to get ahead of that and set him up for success. Paul had been around the block a few times. Like I said, created a few riots, caused a lot of upset in the Jewish church. I mean, he, he had been around. People had said some things to him, uh, as, as you might know if you've read the Bible. So Paul wrote this letter to set Timothy up for success, preparing him that, hey, I want you to just go into this knowing there's going to be some battles, so let's get you ready. Follow my instructions. Here's some, some good advice from, from God and from God's word. He warned him to cling to his faith in Jesus and keep his conscience clear because Paul had seen what happens if you don't. And Paul, I bet he had seen some Christian leaders because he's very troubled here. He's talking to this young leader. He says, man, I've seen some people, they start violating their conscience. They start making little compromises. They start letting little sins in. And eventually, they, it, they, it leads them away from Jesus. And Paul said, Paul's saying to Timothy, I don't want that for you. I, I don't want that for you. I want you to stay strong till the very end. So I'm going to give you some advice. He writes him the Bible <laughs> in a letter. Uh, and so that's pretty cool. Paul's second major letter, that was from 1 Timothy, Paul's second major letter to Timothy, aha, uh -huh, also called to Timothy, was his, happened to be Paul's final letter of his life that we have, final letter of, of his ministry. He writes 2 Timothy to Timothy. Paul, at this time, was in prison for at least the second time. This was not the nice house prison where all the people, all the friends were visiting him and he's getting everybody saved. This was a dungeon in Rome waiting to be executed for preaching Jesus. So he's in a very different setting. He's in a very different mood, a very different vibe. Second Timothy is very personal. It's very intense. Yeah, Paul is looking ahead to the point he talks about dying. And seeing Jesus face to face, like this is a very intense letter. But in it, Paul demonstrates some really great principles for mentoring Timothy. So the second one is speak life. Speak life. It's one of our core values. We speak life. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, he said, I am writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God, and, and by the way, I just noticed as I, as, as I was preparing for this, in 1 Timothy, Paul was all excited and jazzed about Timothy, and he called him my true son in the faith. It is very beautiful and precious and should not be taken for granted that at the end of Paul's life, at the end of his ministry, he was still his dear true son in the faith. That speaks highly of Paul, and that speaks highly of Timothy. So Timothy stayed faithful and he did heed those instructions so that at the end of Paul's life when he's saying, I'm about to be poured out like a, a drink offering on the ground. I'm about to die. Timothy is still his true son of the faith. Wow, that is awesome. So he says, I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Timothy, I thank God for you. And then he goes on. I just wanted to just emphasize those things. So here, how did Paul speak life? He did a couple things. He used the language of blessing. That's, that's language like this. May, our, uh, may God give you grace, mercy, and peace. That is a, that is a blessing. That is, a, that is the language of blessing. May God protect you. May God lead you. May God provide for you. May God make you fruitful and multiply. That, that's the language of blessing. And then Paul also used the language of gratitude. 
Uh, Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue can bring life, uh, death or life. And Paul spoke life over Timothy. Really cool. The, 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 um, the language of gratitude is, is when you say, thank you for doing this. Thank you for being this way. I appreciate you. That, that is the language of thankfulness, of gratitude. And when you speak gratitude to anyone of any age, up, down, below, sideways, when you speak gratitude over people, you actually raise their self-esteem. You, you actually, our words are that powerful. You actually infuse life into people when you speak that way. And Paul did that. He spoke life to Timothy. So language of blessing is when you say, uh, may the Lord do, fill in the blank, this positive thing in your life. Language of gratitude is where you stop. And you, sometimes you got to just stop and think. What, what, what am I thankful for? Because maybe in the hurry of life, you don't think this way. But stop occasionally and just say, what do I, what do I appreciate? Ah. And then, then you say, I'm thankful for, fill in the blank, this about you, this positive thing. That's how we speak life. And, and Paul sets a really great example. A third principle, lead by example. Lead by example. In, in 2 Timothy uh, 1.3, the rest of that verse, he, he says, uh, he, he says, the, he refers to the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. So remember, way back, Paul said, make sure you keep a clear conscience. And now at the end of Paul's life, Paul's saying, I've got a clear conscience. And so Paul was leading by example. He had, it wasn't just that he told Timothy, you need to have a clear conscience. He told him that, and he lived it out. He set a good example for Timothy. And then in addition to just his words, Paul took him on, on ministry trips. He showed him how he led by example. He said, hey, Timothy, come over here. I want you to see how I handle this, uh, this attack that's coming at me right now, or I want, to see, want you to see how I prepare a message. He showed him by example. Paul made conscious choices to not compromise, which was a great example for Timothy. Yeah. To the point where Paul, oh my goodness, wow, he... He's bold. In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul said, And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's big. Like, I, uh, <laughs> I'm not quite ready to say that. Paul, Paul is saying, I, I'm keeping my, my nose clean. I'm keeping my heart devoted. I'm keeping my mind focused on God. So you should imitate me in that. And fo let's follow Christ like I am. A fourth principle, pray consistently. Pray consistently. In 2 Timothy 1.3, he goes on and says, night and day. Wow. In other words, today we'd say 24-7. I constantly remember you in my prayers. And that's one of the most thoughtful and powerful things you can do for someone, for kids, for grandkids, for someone you're mentoring. Uh, maybe they're, they're a similar age or just a little younger than you. You, by, by saying, by first of all praying and then saying that you're praying, that is very encouraging and very powerful. In James 5.16, it says, pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Perhaps one of the reasons why Timothy did actually stay faithful, loyal to Jesus and to Paul all the way to the end was because Paul constantly prayed for him. And one of the wonderful results was Timothy's faithfulness. That is so cool to me. That is awesome. All right, we're in speed mode now. The next principle, <laughs> express your affection. Express your affection. In 2 Timothy 1.4, Paul says, I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. Remember, they're each going to different cities and ministering. And Paul says, I will be filled with joy when we are together again. Paul is saying, I know you were sad and if you felt something when I left. I want you to know I felt something too. I love you, my true son in the faith. Paul expressed his affection for Timothy, but we don't always know where to start. So I want to just suggest, it, I, 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 this is so practical, it's so common, try the five love languages. If you can't think how to express affection for somebody, if you're mentoring someone, perhaps if they're a, a son or a daughter in the faith, give them a hug. Give them a, a motherly or fatherly hug. Uh, another way is to speak affirming words over them. 
and just use that language of, of blessing and praise and thankfulness. Give them a thoughtful gift. Um, it doesn't have to be expensive. So sometimes uh, a, a gift that is just thoughtful, maybe handmade or just thought through, uh, is, that is very meaningful and it expresses affection. And uh, another one is invest some time. Let's, let, let's just go to coffee, no agenda, let's just be together. And by the way, I'll treat. All right, that, that's a great way to express affection. Yes, and I'll already take a number, please. Take a number, take a number. Um, or just do something nice and practical for the person that you are mentoring or, or for your kids that you're raising up. Wash their bike, polish it, wax it up. Uh, wash their car. To, if they're an older, older person you're mentoring, uh, take it to the car wash. You know, uh, express your affection. That is a great way to encourage and to raise up the next godly generation. And the last one, Woo, por fin. Raise the bar. Raise the bar in their lives. So you're doing all this positive, you're inputting, inputting all this good stuff and praying for them 24-7. But also challenge them. Challenge them a little bit. 2 Timothy 1, 5 to 8 says, Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. Yea, for moms and grandmas that pass on the faith. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you, okay, here's kind of upping it a little bit here. I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. So they're all, I picture like they're in a commissioning service or they're in a prayer uh, gathering and Paul lays his hands on Timothy and God's just speaking to him and he's ministering and oh God, I pray you give him the gift of, of speaking clearly and, and declaring your word, stuff like that and God does it. Everyone senses that, wow, God did that. Paul says, okay, that was cool, but don't let it just lie dormant. Let's fan into flames the gifts, the experiences, the talents that God's given you. So Paul's saying, that was awesome, but let's, come on, come on. There's more, there's more. I see more in you. Verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So there's, uh, it's thought that Timothy maybe was struggling in some of those areas. And Paul's going, buddy, come on. We got too much to do. We got the kingdom of God to build. So come on, get up. That, that fear you're feeling, that's not from God. Come on, fan into flames the gift that God gave you when we prayed for you. And he says, so never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And this is so touching. Paul says, and don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. Wow. Paul's raising the bar. So he's even saying, hey, and by the way, faithful Timothy, when it gets a little hard or if it gets very hard, there's no giving up. You be ready to suffer for Jesus just like I am in this dungeon in Rome about to be executed for my faith. And Paul's saying, come on. I'm, I'm cheering you on. Let's go. Let's do this. You're, you're made for more. Don't be settling. Don't be relaxing too much. Come on, let's go. Let's serve the Lord with all you got. Man, what a cool mentor. Or if, a, if, a, if he was a dad or a grandpa saying those things, wow, that is awesome. So don't get comfortable. Stir up your gifts. Choose power, love, and self-discipline. Be bold in sharing Jesus. And if you're called to suffer for your belief in Jesus, it's worth it. It's worth it. That is so great. So if you are ready to raise up the next godly generation, whether it's your kids or your grandkids or someone you're mentoring, what are you going to do? This is what we're going to do. Set them up for success. Speak life. Lead by example. Pray consistently. Express your affection and then raise the bar. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand with me if you're in the room, if you're online. Let's, let's make where you are a place of prayer. We're going we're gonna to go to prayer. So why don't you bow your heads with me, if you would, for just a moment. And let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the example that we see of Paul mentoring Timothy, the, the older generation raising up the new. And Lord, I pray that you would help all of us <clears throat> to be involved in helping someone else follow Jesus. Uh, regardless of the age, Lord, I pray, Lord, that every teenager will be raising someone up 
to follow Jesus. I pray that every grandma and grandpa and everyone in between will be raising someone up to follow Jesus. We know that that is your plan to save the world. And we want to be a part of your plan. Are you raising kids in your home right now? Maybe you're a father, mother, grandparent, guardian. If you're raising kids in your home, would you raise your hand? Because I just want to pray for you. I want to pray a blessing on you. Yeah, many hands going up. Yeah. All right, you can put them down. Are you, maybe uh, whether or not you have uh, kids in your home, are you mentoring someone right now uh, to follow Jesus? Maybe you're just kind of helping someone, like maybe you're praying for them occasionally, checking in on them, holding them accountable. Why don't you raise your hands? Just someone you're, you're mentoring. I, I have people that I'm mentoring as well. Yeah, quite a few of us, and that's, that's really cool. That's awesome. Uh, here's the last question uh, in this, in this uh, before I go, uh, pray again. Would you like to be a mentor? Would you like to be leading someone? Would you like to be discipling someone, even casually? Let me see your hand if you'd like to. Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah. Let's pray that God would answer your prayer, all right? Let's pray together. Lord, I pray uh, for every person who's raising kids in the home. It is so hard especially with the world bombarding today like never before, bombarding and actually invading our homes with information, etc. So I pray for every parent, grandparent, guardian, Lord God, every foster parent, Lord God, I, I just pray for each one that is raising kids in their home that you would bless them, Help them stay faithful. Help them stay true to you. Help them to not lose their temper. Help them to love unconditionally. It's so hard. We cannot do this without your help. And that's why I'm praying you would help each of us that are in that category to have your love, have your patience, your joy. Help us to have all the fruits of the Holy Spirit so that we can do it. For those of us who are mentoring people, Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom. Sometimes it's hard to know what, what to even suggest or, or, or how to pray. Lord God, show us how. Lord, help us to not take your role, Holy Spirit. Help us not to be the Holy Spirit, but help us to be a channel of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would work through us who are mentoring. Lord, give us godly counsel and good timing, Lord God. And then, Lord, for those that said, man, I would like to be mentoring someone or raising up the next, next generation, even if it's one person, even if it's casual or more formal, Lord, I pray you bring someone. Perhaps there's already someone in our lives we haven't noticed. Lord, open our eyes and help us to notice and help us to be involved in raising people uh, up in the next generation to be godly, to follow Jesus. And with your head still bowed, I want to give one more invitation, and that is an invitation to faith in Jesus. Now, we're talking about some good works today, mentoring people, raising kids. Those, those are good works, but I, I just got to tell you the truth. That does not save you. You can't take in enough foster kids to get you to heaven. That is not how it works. The trouble is we were all born into sin, you and I, we're born into sin, so we need to pay for those sins. Jesus said, I will do it. He came, he gave his life on the cross to pay for your sins and for mine. And so we can put our faith in his work, in what he did, and then good works can flow out of that from a place of salvation, not to earn your place in salvation. So I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus, to become his apprentice. How do you do that? Turn away from your sin, turn your life over to God, and let him lead. If you want to do that today, right here in the room, would you raise your hand? And that hand just says, Pastor, I want to do that today. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to put my faith in him. And there are several hands going up today, and that is very awesome. I see you guys, and that is great. God sees you. He knows your heart online. Would you raise your hand to God? Because I can't see you this way, but he can see you. The one who is everywhere can see you. I'd like to coach you all in a prayer. Would you just repeat after me online in the room? Would you repeat after me? We're all going to support him. But if you raised your hand, would you say these words to Jesus from your heart. Let's go. Here we go. Jesus, Jesus I, invite I invite you into my life. Into my life. Please, forgive me Please forgive me of my sin, of my sin. and make me new. Make me new. 
I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We just give you some applause. And if you just prayed that prayer with me for the first time, or if you have prayed it before, would you just text the word restart to the phone number 97000? That will let me know I made that decision today. And I want to know. I want to cheer you on. All right? God bless you, everybody. Thank you so much, Pastor Garen. I love how every time I listen to a message from Pastor Garen, he has such practical steps to follow. It's nothing that's impossible or outlandish to, to teach, but it's just so practical. And mentoring someone truly has just bigger effects than we can even realize. It makes such a big impact. Those little things that seem so small and insignificant at the time have the greatest impact on people. So um, as we're closing up our service, just a reminder, if you're new with us, text GREET to 97000. That way we can connect with you. Make sure you give us your email so we can get back to you. Um, if you're watching online or in the room, um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That just helps us to have more people find our content so we can disciple more people to follow Jesus. Um, and immediately following the service, again, we have root beer floats for everyone. So right outside in the plaza, there'll be root beer floats. And for all of our guys, whether you're a dad or not, we have some beef jerky. Um, so I'll see you guys next Sunday. Have a blessed week and happy Father's Day.